I'm Sean Ferrick here for Trek Culture and today I will be going through all of the ups and downs for Star Trek Discovery Season 4 Episode 1, Kobayashi Maru. Now before I say anything else, let's address the elephant in the room. To everyone who is watching this video, please let's be mindful of spoilers. We all of the rogues swept out from under us there during the week and so we know that a large portion of our usual friends and audience will not be able to join us. So let's show a little bit of compassion. Let's remember we are Starfleet. Now let's go through this episode. I'm gonna kick straight off by saying this is a strong opening episode. We are back with a bang as we are used to with Discovery, but it was also, there was just enough character development in this episode to make sure it doesn't lean too heavily one side or the other. We open up with an attempt at second contact, if you will. Book and Burnham are on the planet trying to engage these aliens to come back to the Federation. I will admit, they looked a little bit silly. They were giant butterflies. I have nothing against butterflies. Some of my best friends are butterflies. But yes, they looked a little bit ridiculous. However, this is Star Trek. I'm kind of okay with them looking ridiculous. Was it a bit kind of laugh out loud funny as they were flying through the uh, forest? Yeah, right, a little bit. But the banter between Book and Burnham more than makes up for this. And the way that they managed to pull off the mission, deliver the dilithium, and get these people kind of back friendly with Federation, I'm gonna say that's an up from me. It was fun, it was silly, it was ridiculous, it was pretty much everything we've come to expect and hope for from Star Trek so far. So as an opening scenes goes, I like that one very, very much. The scene effectively sums up what Burnham says that we are the Federation, this is what we do. We have ridiculous adventures, but really at the end of the day, we're all just trying to build a bigger unity and community together. And before I move on from this scene, take a second up discovery, Reese in the captain's seat. Yep, yep. We're gonna give you a third up discovery because we've updated the opening credits for season four which I really, really like, but you see, I spent all of season three kind of wondering, okay, I like that we've got the updated credits, but where's the Discovery A? Well, it's here. It is completely on show in the opening credits, and I could not be happier because while maybe it took a little while for me to come around and detached nacelles, I am so on board at this point. So seeing it there, that's our third up of the episode, Disco A in the opening credits. Just like slipping into a warm bath we get Kaminar, and also we get to see that the Kelpians and the Ba'ul seem to be living in harmony. The Ba'ul living outside of an ecosphere that's underwater, with the Kelpians living inside. Sukal seems to have been more or less accepted into Kelpian society. Eh, listen, the burn happens to us all. <laughs> Do you remember the burn? But I really like how they seem to have made it work in the thousand years that it's been since Saru has been home. And never have we really seen Saru more serene than he is during this scene. It's a lovely, quick kind of summary as to what he's been doing. He says it's been five months that he's been on Kaminar. And you can see that being home has done him well. We cut back then to Discovery as it's on the way to Federation headquarters and we see, oh God, the ship is doomed. There's a Tribble just walking around throughout the corridors in Disco. Down, down you mad people. What are you doing leaving a Tribble running around? Yes, all right, maybe they might have found a way to encourage the Tribbles not to do what Tribbles do. But I mean, you're just asking for trouble in that point. Down. But moving on from the ecological disaster waiting to happen there, we can see that the visual effects people behind Discovery were listening last season. And just before Discovery jumps into the Federation headquarters, we get a lovely pan shot of the Voyager J taken up. We love Voyager J. We're, we're, we're somewhat fans of Voyager in general here. We then get, you know, the commencement ceremony of the new Starfleet Academy, and we get the new president. We will discuss her momentarily after Burnham gives this commencement speech. It's, it's quite the swelling moment, and it's what we want from Star Trek. It's all about encouraging exploration, it's encouraging unity, and it's encouraging 
the drive to better oneself. It's, it's a pretty wonderful moment in the episode. Now it's only overshone by something Rillick says in her speech. She says that Starfleet used to be about scientific exploration and on that vein she reveals Archer Space Dock. I defy you if you have emotion within you to not feel something as Archer's theme plays over the reveal of the space dock, which is absolutely, of course, evocative of space dock from Star Trek The Motion Picture and The Wrath of Khan and Star Trek Generations. It is, it is just like a warm drop of honey has fallen down into my chest. It is a massive up from me. It is almost the moment of the episode for me. It is just wonderful. Plus the fact that Voyager J is the ship in there, was not to love. Now, in this episode, we have the return of Audit Fair as Admiral Vance, but he is very much an extended cameo. When the distress call comes through to Starfleet that the space station needs to be saved by Discovery, he is there to send Burnham on her way, but that's pretty much it. Now, having said that, it's quite lovely to see him and his family are back as well. This, this pleases me a lot. It's, it's, it's neither an up nor a down of the episode. It is just, it's so nice to see him happy again because we spent the whole of season three going, well, he's a gruff person, isn't he? God, he could do with an L smile. Well, he smiles plenty in this episode. It's very enjoyable to see. But the role that he seemed to play in season three seems to be subverted by Lara Rillick from this season. So she is now the president of the Federation and I will say up from me. I really liked her in this episode. She is such a politician and yet she is able to do her job, be who she's supposed to be without, at no point did I feel like, ah, oh, there'll be a villain reveal. And I did think that a little bit about Vance last season, that we would get a villain reveal, which of course we didn't, thankfully. And I never felt that about Willig. I felt she is, you know, quite Machiavellian in her actions. She will do what needs to be done to win the day. And we get to see that over the course of the episode. As the Discovery leaves, Buck leaves on his ship because he's going home to Kui Jean. His nephew is going through a sort of a christening of sorts, becoming one with the planet. And I'll be honest, down. Kui Jean didn't care for it. Didn't care for it last season, don't care for it this season. It's not that anybody is particularly bad in this scene, they aren't. David Ajala is brilliant. It's just that... Mm -hmm. That was really all the feeling I got from these scenes. So, I have to say, if they could just remove Quajon altogether, I think the show would be a little bit better for it. The Discovery arrives at the space station and finds it spinning through space. It has been walloped out of its normal position by a spatial disruption. Now, there's a lovely bit of banter between Awasakon and Detmer when they're saying, can one manage this? Oh, I can if the other one can do this. And yeah, sorry, that's an up from me. I really, really like this pairing. It's taken a while, but the Discovery crew really has settled into themselves. We know who they are. Now, we are missing Bryce, really, from this episode because he's been reassigned to another ship just for a while, we're told. And we have the new Lieutenant Christopher. Lovely. We have Reese. We have a very different Tilly. We have Lieutenant Tilly, which actually, on that moment, Lieutenant Tilly, Lieutenant Commander Owasakon, Lieutenant Commander Detmer, yeah, you get a promotion, and you get a promotion, and you get a promotion. Thank you, Chris, for that one. That was brilliant. Loved it. They're finally getting the recognition that they need. Also, I want to take a moment to extend my personal condolences to Garrett Wang and, of course, Harry Kim, who I believe by the 32nd century is still an ensign. Sorry, mate. Sorry. They line up with the space station and Adira and Tilly are tasked with going over to help the space station with a delivery of programmable matter to get it back on track and to you basically save the day. Adira has been promoted now to Ensign and they are just nervous. They are running their mouth, but they are 
they're ready for this. We get a little bit of a, a moment with Grey, just enough to remind us that yes, yes, a body is coming for Grey. That is absolutely happening. So just a little bit of a holdover from last season, but also lovely, lovely to see them together. Adira and Tilly go over to the space station. There's a little bit of a thanks very much. You know, we, we do need your help, but we also do know what we're doing here, which is nice because a lot of times in Star Trek, you have your main cast will turn up and only they can save the day. So you're kind of like, well, what was the point of the other crew being in place at all? No, there is a little bit of back and forth that seems to work for this. Commander Nallis of this space station is a bit like, great that you're here, thanks very much. I can actually do this, but I appreciate your help. And I do like that, I do like that a lot. Of course, this is Star Trek, so have a bunch of space rocks thrown at you, because why wouldn't you? Cool moment where the Discovery extends its shields all around the space station and I will say the visuals, of course, in this episode are, they're fantastic. It's what we've come to expect from Discovery. If I'm being really harsh, and I am being really harsh, because that's what we do here, I'm going to give a down, sorry, to how much we spend watching space rocks and explosions and this doing that and doing that. There was a little bit of padding, it felt. This episode is 50 minutes long. You could have probably lost about five minutes from extended shots of, this, that, this, and that. It's not that it didn't look good, it was just like, less is more. I realize Discovery's main theme is not exactly less is more, but less might have been a bit more for this one. Once Adira and Tilly are over on the space station and the rocks start blowing into everything, of course, Discovery starts trying to fix everything. Burnham calls down to Stamets, whose first question is, is Adira okay? Now this, of course, is the fact that Stamets, Culber, Adira, and Grey are a family unit that was built together in season three. And we've been assured by Wilson Cruz, by Blue Del Barrio, and by Anthony Rapp that this will continue and only get developed further into season four. So seeing Stamets, while not ignoring Tilly and the rest of the crew, ask for Adira first, that's an up from me. I liked that. It's a gentle reminder that at its core, Family is one of the biggest themes of Star Trek overall. There is a lot of here, there and everywhere going on on the space station. But what we do get as well is we get a little bit of a confrontation between Burnham and Rillick, which of course we were always going to do, really came along on the Discovery. You know, she calls out Burnham and she's exactly right to do it. But, and this is something I realise I have not often said on the ups and downs for Discovery, Burnham was right too. Detmer says she can take a worker bee over to the station and fix everything and get some debris out of the way so the escape vehicle can help. However, Burnham quite rightly says she's the one who's logged the most space hours and is the most qualified for this mission. Rillick correctly says, is it right for the captain to leave the bridge at a time of emergency? They're both completely correct and Rillick is the one who has the good grace to go, it's your ship, it's your ship. I liked this entire exchange. This was enough from me because it was shades of, well, Burnham's gonna burn him, but she was right to do what she did and it was recognized in the moment. So it was sort of playing on that expectation of the audience in this scene. Rillick continues her politicianship by talking down Nullis, who has pulled a phaser on Tilly over on the station, not because of some nonsense, it's because a suicide mission will in fact save the rest of the crew. Somebody stays behind, ensures the crew get away. There's always another way. Of course, this is Star Trek. Rillick manages to talk Nullis down by explaining about, you know, kind of reminding him about wanting to go home, about wanting to see his planet, telling him that she knows how beautiful it is. As Burnham later points out, all she was read his file, but she knew what to do in the moment to talk the man down. And as I say, Rillick is an overall up for me in this episode. Really, really liked her in this because it was exactly the right thing to do in that moment. Now, unfortunately, while almost all of the crew escape, not all of them do. And Nullis is in fact killed on the rescue mission. The station is completely obliterated. And as Burnham later counts, three people died, four people are critically wounded. Now, Rillick replies with, Yes, but nine people who would otherwise have died make it back. And they discuss the merits of the Kobayashi Maru. That pairing of words 
is potentially the most famous two words in Star Trek because of course of the exchange between Kirk and Spock at the end of the Wrath of Khan. What did you think of my solution to the Kobayashi Maru? They speak about it, there's an understanding between the two and, and quite frankly, I like where it's left. Rillick says that, you know, Burnham is fantastic in what she does, but she is reckless and you cannot always prioritize the needs of the few over the needs of the many, which of course harks back to the lessons of Spock. This is not done in a really insubordinate way. They speak of command of Voyager J, there's a new pathway drive being designed for it. And Rillick says that no, Burnham's not in the running because of her reckless nature, because huge swings of the pendulum. Today, it worked out perfectly. Tomorrow, it might not. It's an absolutely fair point. Burnham replies with discovery is my home and with the greatest of respect, if you tried to reassign me, I would have turned it down. Which obviously, thanks to Commander Riker, we know you can always turn down a promotion. I really like this scene. I'm really interested to see where their relationship goes throughout the rest of the season because you know, while Rillick is not Starfleet, she is the head of the Federation. You know, she wants Burnham gone, Burnham's gone. But I think there's gonna be an understanding between these two characters. We finish up the episode with Book coming back to Discovery, his ship having been knocked into, you know, knocked into flight by a massive spatial distortion. They need to get back to Quajon to find out exactly what happened, but then Owasakun drops the bomb there is no equation. It's been knocked out of orbit and this spatial disturbance has destroyed the planet and my God discovery, I was joking. I didn't say destroy the planet. I just said, let's not visit there as much. Good. How much power do I have? Strong, strong ending to the episode. I will give it an up for a cliffhanger ending. I will also give it a down so that I will not go mad with power for the rest of the season. This down is for me and my world ending ability for the first time for Discovery Season 4. Come with me as we visit Cetacean Observations. The trusty pad is back. The, it, it was quite light on eggs in this episode, which I actually like. We have Felis Catus is called out during the opening scene, which of course is the greatest poem ever written by a certain commander data. We have the return of the Ba'ul, which we haven't seen since season two of Discovery. While they're still, frankly, terrifying looking, it's great to see them coexisting on Kaminar. We had a call out to Bryce has been reassigned to the USS Curry. Now, the last time we saw the Curry was the opening shot of DS9 season six, A Time to Stand. While not potentially an egg, Discovery extends its shields all over the space station, which is evocative of how many different times Starfleet has done that before. But think specifically of Voyager and Equinox when you're trying to protect them against the nucleogenic life forms. There's a Lorian on the station. And as you know, I see a Lorian, I call it out. Now, this might be reaching, but Rillick says they're looking at the next generation spore drive. And I'm sorry, now I'm just picturing a galaxy class starship with a spore drive. That might not be an egg, but Oh, come on, I'm excited. It's a new season. I implore you all, do not spoil this for the people who can't watch it. Remember, we are all in this together and we are all going to enjoy this together when we can. So if you're tweeting at anything, remember you can catch us on Twitter at Trek Culture. Just please pop hashtag Star Trek Discovery into your tweets, which will allow people to mute them if they need to. Now, I am sure I have missed things in this episode, so please drop them into the comments below. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. As you know, you are massively helping the channel every time that you do that. You can catch me on all the socials at Sean Ferrick. Folks, look after yourselves until next week. Whatever you do, make sure you do it well. Make sure you just look after yourself. If you do the Kobayashi Maru, I really hope you don't face the uh, certain death scenario. I got a bit dark there. So how about you live long and prosper instead? Thanks very much. Cheers.